Hi, I'm David Swan. I'm the technology editor at the Australian newspaper. Hi, I'm Jonathan Rubenstein. I'm the CEO at Nuix. Nuix is a leading data and investigative software company which has AI built into all our solutions. We're here today to talk about AI for good and how artificial intelligence is set to shake up our economy and our society more broadly. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we might just kick off first if everyone could introduce themselves. Um, we might start with you, Simon, down at the end. Uh, Simon Burns, I'm a partner in the tech and IP practice at Gilvan Tobin. I'm Johanna Weaver and I'm the director of the Tech Policy Design Centre at ANU. John Henderson, I'm a partner at Airtree Ventures. Uh, Simon Bush, CEO of the Australian Information Industry Association. So the first part of our discussion will be discussing the challenge and opportunity in creating ethical AI for good. What do you make of the, the current global debate when it comes to AI? And what sort of principles should we be considering? I think it's fair to say that it's equal parts excitement and hype um, and probably some good doses of fear in there as well. For me, I think the most fundamental thing to recognise is that um, if we want AI for good, we need to acknowledge that AI could equally be used for bad and that's an, as equally a likely outcome. I don't say that to be pessimistic, I just say it because if we use that as the foundation that we start from, it's quite different from the tech optimism of the noughties or the 90s. And it means that we're taking a much more proactive approach to both the way we design the technology, but also the systems we put in place to mitigate it if and when those harms do happen. As the doomsday ex existential mm -hmm. crisis sort of layer, um, which gets a lot of airtime. The other layer, and I think the area where we need to probably focus a little bit more on is the, the harms we experience today. And they're not as exciting and, and as you know, scary, but they're real and, and they're things we're experiencing. So I think we need to sort of focus on that and really test ourselves on the way we can move through those to, to actually get to the good stuff, because otherwise we're gonna get stuck thinking about some Armageddon situations and sort of get nowhere. The debate is by and large fueled by fear. Um, and I think we have a very clear line of sight to a bunch of societal benefits, be it in health or education or you pick your sector. Um, and I think the concerns are, you know, tool based, like these tools will be used for good and bad, no doubt. Mm. But, um, but I think the sort of sentience concerns and the machines turning against us are more religious than, than scientific. I think there's sort of no substance we can point to that um, suggests that's a real risk. I think that's a really good point. I mean, as an as a, as a AML professor in Australia said, it's, it's maths, not magic. I think there, there is a lot of insecurity and fear. I think that's right. Um, and there's two thirds of Australians that have been surveyed that say that they think they need some guardrails and they think they need some understandings to how to use it properly. But I'm a real optimist around the benefits of AI, um, the productivity benefits that we know that they're there, particularly generative AI that's relatively new. Um, and we've seen how powerful those tools are in a whole bunch of use cases. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge optimist um, for AI. However, I'm not a huge optimist in terms of the capitalist system that allocates resources appropriately. So if I look at the big tech companies and their quarterly incentives versus the incentive to create a better world, I'm not sure which one would win out. But my, my, my current feeling is that the quarterly incentive has a stronger uh, outcome than protecting society. Mm. And so therefore self-regulation worries me and I think this is exactly where government does need to step in and put some guardrails around what is good, what is bad, what we should be worried about and how one thinks about some of the frameworks that one can, can implement if you want. Does this feel like a, a landmark moment for, for AI and AI's future? I think we're approaching the landmark moment. I think when, when I think ChatGPT4 has an IQ of 155. Now the question is when when ChatGPT X has an IQ of a thousand or ten thousand, that becomes and it can reproduce itself. I write its own code. I think there are certain frameworks that need to be put in place that say, that that we, we, we consider the risk. I, I do think that there's a lot of a doomsday kind of hype and and uh, fear that I'm not sure is appropriate. But I do think we are reaching singularity where one machine equals one human brain. I think that's Ray Kurzweil's kind of definition mm. of singularity. And I think that when we reach singularity, that doesn't mean uh, that we need to be afraid, but I think we need to consider how we, how we get some regulation in place to manage the risks. And there are risks. Generative AI, I mean, AI has been around for a while, but generative AI is different. There's a lot of experts out there, global experts, 
that say um, this is actually a cha big change in the technology evolution um, since World War II. There's a wonderful saying, what does an optimist call a pessimist? A realist with all the facts. <laughs> and I think we are kind of in that period at the moment where there is a lot of optimism. And I'm also very optimistic of the, the um, potential for artificial intelligence to assist um, in addressing climate change or personalised medicine. I mean, there's so many areas, but I think we also do need to be realistic and put in place those guardrails. But also the guardrails shouldn't be seen as restrictive, right? There's mm. this perception that regulation inhibits innovation. And actually in many respects, if you design it well, it will actually level the playing field and put us in a position where you can be more competitive. I'm gonna be a little bit controversial and suggest that government should be an exemplar when it comes to AI governance mm. and adoption within their own departments. We've seen RoboDebt, which wasn't purely AI, but it used ADM automatic decision-making and algorithms. So there's a real requirement on that trust and transparency piece for us to get that assurance that AI is going to be used for good. Government should be an exemplar. And we've seen in New South Wales, there's some legislation. We know the federal government's doing work, but I think this is where they need to lead. It's, it's probably worth reflecting for a second on just what's captured the zeitgeist at the moment, because this is not a new field. I mean, AI as a field has been around since 1956. But I think what's different, uh, a little bit to Simon's point, is we've gone from a world where you know, these fields of natural language processing and, and image understanding have moved into generation. So the company I ran did algorithmic summarization. There were other fields like semantic analysis and thematic analysis. So we used to be able to understand what text could do. Um, and I think the thing that's captured people's imagination is these machines' ability to generate text in a conversational way which remembers things. It's not just like Siri, which can answer one question and not remember anything else. Um, and so the real change there, if you'd asked me five years ago, you know, what's machine learning going to disrupt? What's the impact going to be? I would have said it's sort of robotics and menial tasks and sort of lower skill white collar jobs. And I think what surprised everyone is it's the creative industries that are really mm. feeling the impact. Um, and this idea of machine driven creativity is, um, is really what's blown people's minds. I think the other change though is, is the level of access. So that tech has been around for a while. Yes, it's got better, but the other, what's happened in conjunction with it getting better is it's been put in the hands of pretty much everyone through the LLMs that are available for free. Um, and that is, I think, that's changed the way people think about it, it's changed the way people engage with it. And we've seen a rush to utilise it by a community that doesn't understand it. And I think that's where we've seen sort of the missteps and the risks pop out. It's not necessarily something which is going to, that, that issue isn't going to persist forever because we're learning from those mistakes. But I think that's, that's caused some of the growing pains that we've experienced over the last six months with, with GPT-4 and its other flavours. And, and just to follow that up, where for you does that responsibility lie when it comes to education of the people using the tools? Is it the vendors? Is it government, where do you see that responsibility? Uh, I sort of think it lies with everyone. And I think we're sort of seeing a little bit of a co-regulatory approach emerge. So you've got the likes of Microsoft who are quite proactively going out there and trying to educate around assurance and how it works and those sorts of things so people can actually utilise their products. So that makes good commercial economic sense. Um, but governments also, I think they have a massive role in sort of picking up the education capability and tools piece. So Regulation, whichever way you cut it, that's that's years away. Like the EU experience has started in 2021. You know, best case, I think they're looking at maybe still a few years down the track before anything's actually active. These tools are not being developed in a legal vacuum, um, and and that is a first point. Um, Simon mentioned standards, which is also you know there are a number of international standards that are being negotiated that are going to be increasingly influential. So I think that's really important. Um, and, and on just to briefly touch on the education point as well, I think we need to be looking at not just education of users, but also of the people that are designing the tech. And that really goes back to my original point about you, you're designing this tech with the best intentions to solve, you know, um, looking at um, the food we eat and the fibres we, we wear. How can we revolutionise that? But also looking at the potential for that to be used in a different, in a, uh, different way. Um, and if we have much more consideration in the way that we're building and designing the tech, that's going to have a big impact on the way that that tech evolves into the future, as much as the regulatory frameworks will. Yes, there's you know, consumer guarantees, there's product safety laws, all sorts of good things. 
a lot of organisations probably haven't quite twigged yeah. to how those laws are going to be applied with an AI lens. And I think it's, it's the individual regulator's role to go out and say, look, this exists. You need to comply with this today. This is what you need to be thinking about with your AI implementations. Mm. Uh, I, I worry slightly differently to you two because um, if I look today at a big issue we've got, which is truth, ignore AI, we've got algorithms that are promoting untruths on a bunch of social media, um, and we haven't been able to regulate that. We've got a Section 230 Act in the US which protects any uh, kind of content on platforms. And my concern is we've now, uh, we, we've got the exacerbation of that risk now with generative AI. And I think that regulation is, is critical to combat some of these risks. I think truth is one of them. I think um, the ability to run a monopoly using AI, the, the, there is a first mover advantage which gives a monopolistic power, which could theoretically have a huge impact to kind of wealth uh, and, and promote uh, wealth inequality. So I think looking at how we manage some of these things early on is critical because I think we're, we're in a world where we've seen the outcome of algorithms that aren't that smart and in fact that are impacting truth today and we haven't been able to regulate around that. David, you, your question around putting the genie back in the bottle, or you should slow down, the answer is no. We should not be. I mean, there's massive productivity benefits for our economy. Why would we as an economy stop that if we could? Mm. Um, and you know, if we stopped it as Western economies, do you think China and Russia would stop their development in AI? So I don't think it's, it's not practical and it's not um, in, in fact doable. Um, we just held uh, the last of our five state I awards and 50% of the finalists in our I awards had an com AI component. Mm. And they're doing good in society for healthcare, aged care, agriculture, you name it. There's AI being, a lot of AI um, innovation being done in this country. Um, and it's, it's a really good thing. How can we ensure that Australia does, in fact, play a leading role in the global AI for good debate? What could set up Australia for success when we're looking at globally and everything that's happening? Look, I've got a view. I think Australia should be at the table. Australia's government should be at those ISO standards tables, should be developing those frameworks. We've got under the quad, uh, there's a critical tech component of that. We can work with India and Japan and the US in developing those frameworks. We've got five eyes. Pillar two is also critical tech, including AI. So the risk of Australia regulating um, too heavily in this space is that our market becomes unviable, right? Um, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to quash innovation. But one of the things that Australia really excels at is, well, how can we organise our government in a way that we can regulate quickly to avoid these harms? Um, this is something my centre has done a lot of work on, looking at how we can cultivate that coordination and put in place structures so the regulators can get access to the independent advice when they need it, so that we have coordination at the ministerial level. I've got a different slant on this, David, in the sense that I think we need to earn the right to be relevant. The countries that are going to be at the table exerting the influence here are the countries from which the important technologies emerge. Mm -hmm. So the US is the centre of this right now. You see Rishi Sunak doing all kinds of interesting things in the UK, partly because DeepMind emerged from there and has become an important player and the sort of triangle around Cambridge and Gatsby and Imperial is a really, has been and continues to be a really important source of research. So I think if we want to have a voice at the international table, we need to have a bunch of innovation come out of this country. And so therefore I would answer your question slightly differently, which is, what are the policies we can put in place to attract core research and encourage real machine learning productization out of this country? Yeah, I agree completely with that. In terms of you know how do we how do we build a strong technology community that has support from the government and where our investment is and and figuring out how and where we will be competitive, I think is a critical step for Australia, and that then drives the investment in technology. I think we have punched above our weight. Uh, in Australia, but I don't think we've done that as a strategic investment decision from government. And in fact, we're going backwards, right? The funding from the federal government, I'm gonna be, again, slightly controversial, but um, the 2021 budget allocated $124 million towards AI commercialization research. That money still not has hit industry. We may get it in 2024 and it's gonna be less than what we're gonna get in 2021. So we're going backwards. Despite that, I agree. We've got some amazing capability and talent in this country. We need to keep that talent. We need to rapidly commercialise what's coming out of our universities. What no one is really talking about in detail is doing a detailed analysis of legal frameworks and 
policy settings and whatever else that are actually causing barriers to using AI. So what do we need to do? There's brilliant use cases out there, but the law says you can't do X. That's what we need to unpick and uncover because that then enables those use cases to get some oxygen and, and get a life that they other wouldn't, otherwise wouldn't have. Mm. I think what the UK did with the FinTech regulatory sandbox was really interesting. Mm. The FCA basically created an area in which FinTechs could explore things that may or may not contravene regulations and then analyse the results and then give them a path to regulatory licensing. That policy, I don't want to say single-handedly, but was a major contributor to the UK becoming a FinTech hub of the world. Um, I don't know what the machine learning version of that is, mm. but I think, um, mm. I think while we're still in this phase of uncertainty and kind of exploration, rather than sort of writing down black letters of what the rules and guidelines should be, we should create a, or well, the government has a role to create a space where innovators can experiment. I think we have to join a global regulatory framework. We need to just think about this is a global technology and we are citizens of the world trying to regulate what Australians AI is versus, you know, we could look at a, a government uh, procurement policies mm -hmm. which encourage that. But I think that, I think that the, the, the high level frameworks and how one thinks about transparency of the technology, how one thinks about those, I think uh, does not have to constrain the, the innovation. We can wrap a high level regulation quite easily around risk management and then refer out to the, you know, the ISO standard on AI impact assessments which has been developed. So there's a world where we can sort of leverage that global standard framework mm. um, into our own regulation quite easily. I was going to say, the, um, so the global standards agree with all of that, we should play in all those roles. Coming back down to industry verticals though, um, there's a risk-based framework that can be equally be applied at that sort of granular level. So for example, drive AI in driverless cars and automation and transport, you can regulate transport and how that's used and it's being done. Healthcare with radiography and AI to determine tumours and, and cancers, it's being used as a very powerful tool and it's probably one of the best examples around why AI is good, right? It saves lives. But you also want a human in the loop and you can regulate its use in healthcare. Some of the risks are different in different industries. I don't think, you know, there is a, if we're too rigid and apply, apply the same framework over a piece of technology which can be used in different ways in different sectors, we're going to naturally, I think, stifle some opportunities. So that sectorial deep dive approach is what I think we should be looking at in Australia with, with earnest. Um, and that it requires really deep domain expertise. You need cooperation of industry and the regulators to actually unpick and understand what is the opportunity, what is the risk, how do we actually move forward in this sector. My concern with the continued focus on a risk-based approach though is that when you are talking about risk it in inherently includes a calculus of probability and this technology is evolving so quickly that we don't necessarily know what's probable. So I do think risk is important uh, in terms of a <coughs> risk-based approach, but we do also need to focus on the potential harms. We have to keep that in mind, otherwise we're gonna repeat the same mistakes that we made uh, in the last generation of technology. Perfect, I think that probably wraps up our first half of our chat really, really nicely. 